This is Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic. And this is Father Gregory Pine. Welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. I guess welcome to guest planning as well. Uh, Father Gregory and I are extremely excited, happy to have Victor Sweeney back with us. He was on the podcast. Um, Father Gregory told me 11 months ago, I jotted down a note so as not to forget being told that 42 seconds ago, uh, but I remembered. So Victor, great to have you back. Um, last time you were here, we talked about, well, you're a mortician, so we talked about like death and those sort yeah. of things, yeah. gathering as, things with that, and we're going to do as that you again. Do yeah. But, that's right. But welcome back. It's great to have you. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. So this this time around, um, we're we're kind of like nearing on everybody's favorite Catholic holiday, Halloween. Uh, so we thought that we would talk about things with death, but also with things of souls and spirits. Halloween's coming, all souls, all saints do, but um, at least more apropos of our conversation um, Halloween and All Souls Day. So thought we'd talk about death, ghosts, ghouls, souls, I don't know, other, other names that I'm forgetting for these sort of things. So that's what we're going to do today. So it's always good to start off by talking about personal subjective experience of things so as to establish the truth of what we're going to talk about. So I was chatting with somebody the other day and thinking about the con and thinking about ghosts. And um, I realized halfway through the conversation, because I, I was thinking about having you on the show again, I realized halfway through the conversation, I wasn't even sure what I believed about ghosts or what I thought about things. So I was doing a little reading, but we're going to start, I'm going to start by asking, well, both of you can chime in, but I think people are more interested in hearing from Victor than Father Gregory, Father Gregory shaking his head no. But what, what, what are your thoughts, given your line of work as a mortician on ghosts, spirits, personal experiences there, lack thereof, let's let's start with let's start with that any cool stories anything like that to get us so to get I, us going yeah i i believe in the supernatural i believe in the metaphysical i i don't believe in ghosts um that said uh, i do experience a lot of these things again and again and again these um I, they're more than coincidence so for instance i had a burial uh several months ago of a young man and we were out in the cemetery and his mother got up and read a poem and i i wish i could remember the poem it was, it was really beautiful it's kind of long but she started reading and it's this overcast day and we're all kind of gathered around the grave and then she says something about and then the sun will shine and i kid you not the sky opened up and we had sunshine for a minute and a half and then it closed back up again and we carried on. And it was the, the timing was just too perfect. Or I've had it happen where we'll all be standing around the graveside and the caskets there, perfectly sunny day, and we'll just get this little light like pouring of rain. That's just the most pleasant thing. Like when it's when it's raining and the sun is shining, it's nice. So there are these strange little things that do happen that I I can't just say it's circumstance or happenstance. Like there has to be something behind it. Um, or, or, um, I don't know, my, my grandma is big on this. She'll always say like, oh, when there's a cardinal, like it's my dad trying to communicate to me or, uh, you know, your grandpa, uh, like will leave me pennies or little trinkets around the house that I find. So I, so I don't know. I don't know if he's leaving pennies around the house necessarily. Uh, but I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to disclose it, but I, I don't believe that ghosts, you know, white filmy things walk around and have a hand in our day-to-day -day lives. I don't believe in that. Yeah. What about you, Father Gregory? Any any Swiss ghosts that you've encountered or have had to deal with? I know I know of no Swiss ghosts at present, but I've only been here for a short time. So hopefully I encounter some Swiss ghosts before too long. Actually, as you were talking, I was recalling a situation. Uh, it kind of falls loosely into the category. Um, it's actually kind of beautiful. So... Um, as I've shared on the podcast, my mom was sick with cancer for a while and she passed away about a year ago. But there was a point when, so my mother like moved into the ground floor of our family home and they had like a hospital bed set up and all the things that she needed in that spot. 
Uh, and there was a woman who would come through every so often just to clean the house because my mom couldn't really keep up with it. Truth be told, I don't think that my mom could keep up with it when she wasn't sick. She didn't want to keep up with it. Uh, so there's a woman who came through and cleaned the house. And um, when my mom got sick, she asked everyone to pray through the intercession of servant of God, Rose Hawthorne, who founded the Hawthorne Dominicans and who, which, which congregation has a charism for taking care of the incurably ill, specifically cancer patients. And so my mom had like prayer cards made up and she had like a woman from church cross stitched a pillow with like this particular prayer on it. It was intense. So like people were really leaning into it, but the woman who came to clean, uh, didn't really know the backstory. And she was cleaning in the room when my mother slept, like my mother was all the time, uh, because my mother was mostly sleeping. And um, she turned at one point, so like kind of like looked up from whatever she was dusting. And then she saw a woman dressed all in white. And she was like, ho, 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 ho. And the woman said, tell her not to be afraid. And then she was like, oh, I'm sorry. And then the woman disappeared. And then as she like continued shell shockedly to clean in the house, she picked up the prayer card of Rose Hawthorne. And she was like, it was that lady. Um, so not a ghost. I mean, a woman who is in the company of God, but can do whatever she wants when it comes to consoling those who invoke her intercession. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was a pretty wild story. I still don't know what to think about it, but I generally think cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, actually, my mom has uh, not a similar story, a similar story though. Um, my mother's mother passed away, um, when she was when my mom was quite young, uh, in her twenties. And after she passed away, my mom was, I think it said that she had fallen asleep in, in the living room of the house that I grew up in and she was awoken and she saw what she thought was her mother kind of standing in the shadows of the dining room, which was, you know, right abutted the, the, the living room. But more than that, she said that she, she could smell her mother's perfume. That's what woke her up that, that scent. So I don't know if that's a, like a, psychosomatic thing or a memory thing or what but you you look like the smell thing got you excited victor what yeah what, i've i've heard of that, that happening to a group of people yep where like where they've more if, a group of people at one time yep yep like there was a family a wow. family holiday and they smelled grandma's perfume and no one had grandma's perfume so yeah that's yep. yeah so these things and then you hear stories like the other the other a couple of weeks ago actually you were there father Gray, when we were when you were in town here in new hampshire we were we went out for to the, there's this great uh this great whiskey place nearby in vermont so we went for a little tasting one afternoon to get a break from recording and the woman was very talkative and telling us about the ghosts that lived in that building and how she turns on music and other things and yeah so i don't know that's not my experience but i think a lot of people experience that so I don't know, maybe, maybe for our purposes, for our conversation, it might be worth defining at least for the sake of, yeah, the conversation, what do we mean? Is there a difference between a ghost, a soul, a spirit, a demon, separated souls? I think there are a lot of words that are used interchangeably here, but, but perhaps they sh ought to be used more specifically, at least in, in thinking about it. What do you, Father Gregory, do you have any theological insight there? No. Your face says no, but you're going to no, say I'm, something. I'm going to get some thoughts. I don't know how too terribly specific they're going to be, but um, just thinking in terms of sending it over to Victor, I think, I mean, a soul is what makes a body to be alive. So uh, and plants have souls and animals have souls and human beings have souls. Our soul is particular in that it's a rational soul and that it has capacities which go beyond the body that it animates. So it's immaterial and therefore immortal. And so when we talk about something spiritual, we're talking about something that's immaterial. We're talking about something that's not circumscribed by matter. And so there's, you know, there's overlap there, obviously, but there are other spiritual things which aren't souls. So for instance, angels are spirits, but they aren't souls because they're spirits who don't inform a body. They don't animate a body. God is spirit, for instance, but he's not soul, except insofar as he pre-contains our souls. But then when it comes to ghosts, I think we're talking about someone who's died and who's visiting. Um, and I think that that, you know, begins to kind of like set up the question of for what reason or by whose permission or, uh, ultimately like what sense is to be made of the situation. Maybe that's like a, a little bit of a rough sketch. Yeah. I, I guess with that, Victor, what is, is there a sort of, um, is there a sort of like within the world of mortician and funeral homes and undertaking a sort of understanding of differences like that? Is there 
is there not a kind of i guess what what you know from your perspective from your kind of world of things what is what is sort of the um yeah what's going on there like what I mean, should most, i don't know people most, who are yeah. coming to a funeral home think about or that sort of thing yeah most morticians that i know are pretty agnostic uh, about the idea of ghosts or um souls visiting i mean you hear about it enough that there has to be something going on um for instance actually in my mom's family all the ladies when they pass away they tend to see their older relatives like sitting on the end of their bed right before they die um but again how do you you know how do you define that or is that just something that's like personal can you know if if i walked into the room what i see you know my great grandma sitting on the bed i i don't know but uh, there are a lot of people that do th like to think the funeral home itself is haunted, which is interesting. Or I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, your people don't like the funeral, funeral home, funeral homes yeah, in general, or just in general. I mean, uh, the living don't really yeah. like to visit the funeral home, so I can't imagine why 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 we would get a visitation uh, from a soul if that were indeed a thing. Yeah, yeah. The the whole I think. I mean, obviously, part of the challenge of trying to like understand what is and what isn't in this is that it's not, part, as Father Gregory was saying, it's not part of the material world. So the the ability to sort of test things in the um, in the spiritual world becomes a bit more difficult, um, right? Like I I've watched, I'm sure we've seen shows on different like ghost hunters or I don't, I don't even know what they're called. Um, where they kind of come in with physical devices to measure physical changes because of different presences or that, you know, whether it's obviously, I don't know if you can measure smells, I, I bet you can, but temperatures or these, you know, energies or whatever. But in the end, it's sort of hard to sort of get a metric, right. Of like what's going on here. Um, unless do you, you like, do you think a metric yeah, is even methods, really so. important? Yeah. Oh gosh. Now I mean, is that, me is that just some enlightenment <laughs> idea that we need to measure that we need to measure ghosts? Like, does it even really matter? Ah, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I, I think in one sense, so this is that's not a fair, I'm not going to answer in a fair way. I'm going to answer in a typical Father Jacob Birchen way, which is who cares? <laughs> um, you know, like whenever, whenever there's a problem or whenever I'm there's something difficult or whatever, there's something great. It's like, who cares? You know, like why, why does this matter? Um, but for like Jesus Christ, you know, I think most, most questions can be answered with that but because we're talking about ghosts and i don't know i think people want to know right there's the there's i don't know if it's a morbid curiosity but it's a curiosity and if people have experience of them um you know in the in in their lives in different ways people want to know people like also like entertainment on tv so it's kind of cool to go to haunted places i think i don't know um but but yeah i guess as uh as far as like seeing or measuring or having a metric whether or not it's worth it or not whether you adopt my sort of who cares attitude or, or not have you as as somebody who works a lot with with the dead does does that ever like do you ever have um occasion where people are where people ask you come to you about you know whether or not so and so or a ghost or spirit is here or in that place or in that place or is that part of yeah, the world of of your there world. is a lot of that. Yeah, there, um, you know, usually it comes from people who aren't terribly well grounded in their faith, or just in their beliefs, generally. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have, I struggle with that, because you want you want to say the nice thing, right? Like you see someone struggling, and you're like, you, you want to say, Oh, yes, uh, grandma's in heaven. Right? That, that's the thing I think, maybe the knee jerk response. Um, I usually don't answer it that way. I, I try to say like, well, we don't we don't know, we can't know, uh, but it, it is interesting when you talk with people because people do want to believe that not only is grandma in heaven, but that she's also going to visit me <laughs> a lot, or that I can call her to do that, um, and that's and that's a hard thing to have to balance when you talk with people who who want those really hard, you know, firm answers about these sort of um, unknowable things immeasurable things. So just to follow up maybe then on kind of like pinning down what we know, because I think a lot of the conflict that people experience is that there is so much, as we've just alluded to, there's so much that's unknown. Okay. So when thinking about 
if one might be visited by a spirit, that spirit might come from heaven, that spirit might come from hell, that spirit might come from purgatory. If from hell, probably to torture. If from purgatory, maybe to ask intercession. If from heaven, I don't know, to console, to encourage. Okay, all good things. But like, in terms of what we can know or what we're responsible for knowing, it seems like as human beings, we typically go to the immaterial through the material. Doesn't mean that we don't, you know, like reason upon immaterial things. But I'm just saying that oftentimes we're starting with something more tangible. And here I'm thinking of, I may have made this comment in the last interview that we did, but a line from uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who says that the best image of the soul is the body. And now I'm thinking about how like people, for instance, will skirt around particular plots at graveyards because they don't want to walk over the dead, right? When, you know, they're walking over the corpse of the dead and things like that. So maybe from your experience as a mortician, what are things that the body teaches us about the spirit as it were, or like, you know, the soul speaking more specifically? Um, that might help to infuse some reasonable or some otherwise rational discourse into a conversation which is largely, you know, superstitious and anguished. I don't know if there are particular things that occur to you along those lines. I guess in my mind, the, the first thing I think of is that the body is expressly communicative. I mean, that's really what we do with our body most of the time. Right, whether we are communicating with our mouths or with body language, or we are communicating what we believe by our actions. Right, like even you know, I, I, have, a, I have a friend who is a he's a, a woodsman and a carpenter, and he goes and hews trees for whole days, right? And he's probably not talking to anyone, but the action of hewing a tree even tells the world or tells someone something about yourself. So I suppose in that way, like the soul too must be communicative. And I guess if we, if we want to think about that, like our soul is made to communicate with the divine and our bodies are less than that, but made to communicate with others just by our very being here. How's that for an answer? <laughs> I, I let, and I think too of, you know, I was just reading an author who publishes as an who publishes, who publishes who publishes in the journal Communio, which is inspired in large part by the thought of St. John Paul II. And he was referencing this one thing, which made me, whatever, think along these lines. So John Paul II in the Theology of the Body talks about the nuptial meaning of the body, this idea, you know, specifically in the context of the sacrament of marriage, it has particular application. But like what you said, that the human body is communicative and that, um, you know, before the fall, it would have been more so, you know, it would have been sure. untarnished by the various masks that we wear, or by the various deceptions or frauds that we play act. Um, and so there's something about death, I think, which strips some of that away. So people stop pretending as they approach their death, or maybe they, you know, pretend with an even greater rigor and vigor, but it just falls away as a matter of course. Um, yeah, maybe just kind of send it back to you thinking in terms of what St. John Paul II says about the, the nuptial meaning of the body and the kind of communicative nature of the body, which reveals ultimately like our vocation, our identity, our mission as Christians. And then how does like the approach to death somehow, I don't know, uh, inject a, a backstop against which we can read that or interpret that? I don't quite know, to be honest. Um, I, I think you see, <laughs> you see it, I mean, to your point, you see it going both ways. You see people that build walls um, with more vigor, right? I, I can't tell you how many times I've met with families where dad has died in the hospital bed, but only after everyone has left, right? So everyone will be there with him and then they go leave the room to go have lunch for 20 minutes and he dies in that 20 minute span, right? Just the idea of like, you, you can't share this moment with anyone. This is, you know, I don't know, a, a hardened machismo kind of thing, but I, I see it all the time. Um, but then you do also see the opposite where I think people do get more communicative or they do uh, express themselves with maybe greater fluency on their deathbed in a lot of ways. They, they tell the family stories. And, uh, you know, I, I, had a, I had a Lutheran gentleman who I know the day he died made like a borderline full Catholic confession like to his pastor, which is uh, unusual. Uh, but it does kind of speak of the speak to the truths of of um, maybe communicating more wholly when death is imminent. Yes. Yeah, there's one of one of the things. So 
one of the things that interested me in thinking about th in this exact sort of topic of ghosts and, and the body and the soul and the connection there thereof is is how uh i guess saint thomas is i what well, what i what i found was that he's sort of a believer in ghosts at least according to other people and his experience or recounting and countering ghosts or souls um and in in his summa he writes about this this idea that there are that um well he asked the question whether or not souls go immediately to heaven or to hell at the separate you know at the separation of of at the moment of death at the separation of body and soul and he says by nature naturally in a sense yes but unless there's something blocking that soul um from from going to going to heaven um because he talks about the block being sin so if sin venial sin were in the way we often think here of purgatory that a soul would go to purgatory right but he doesn't say that explicitly but just that a soul may be blocked from going immediately to heaven and i think we there's this um there's this uh, sometimes like this fear of ghosts. And I don't know if perhaps that requires like a distinction between sort of demonic activity where there's sort of a malicious intent of, from the spiritual world. But there's this idea of ghosts that are like not have yet have yet to pass over or have yet to like get to heaven or there's something here that they have to finish or, you know, there's this kind of not yet complete thing, which might be a sort of secular notion. But it also seems to be something that that at least in some way you know, St. Thomas, a great Catholic theologian, entertained. So I th that made me think of that when you, as as Father Gregory and you were talking about the, the idea of communicating um, and how the body communicates, how the soul communicates, but even more directly how it's the soul communicates to others. And I don't know, I, it just, it makes me wonder about the sort of, um, yeah, the tie between this world and, and the next, that if there's a soul who's like, you know, there's an obstacle, as St. Thomas says, from going immediately to, to punishment or reward, that there's something that needs to be done, accomplished, finished. Um, if that if that is the sort of case of like the communication between ghosts and that sort of thing, I don't know, have you, I guess that's a bit much to say, like, have you experiences yeah. Yeah. In, in your um, work as a mortician, this sort of thing, this idea, beyond this my, popular I, idea? Yeah. Yeah, can I tell you something from my personal life? Sure. Uh, so four years ago, um, on All Souls Day, fittingly, uh, my very best friend from the time I was 14 uh, took his own life. And um, so what happens when you're a mortician, and it's your relative, in this case it was my best friend, is that the family immediately calls you because you seem to have a handle on what to do next or what goes on. Um, so I was kind of in the middle of my friend's funeral arrangements and I had to explain to his parents why they couldn't see him. I helped write the first draft of his obituary. I gave his eulogy, carried his casket, th th these kind of things, which are very good. Um, but so, you know, not to open a whole nother can of worms when you take your life, there are all sorts of issues with that. Um, but uh, so, you know, as I'm explaining this to my little children, you know, why is dad like crying every day? <laughs> uh, you know, I had to explain like, well, we don't we don't know where his soul went. You know, is he going to be responsible? We don't know. Um, but what's interesting is I had some consolations along the way. Like I've had several dreams since he died where like we're just hugging. And like, I, I know like the shape of him. Like if, if you were to wake me up out of that dream, like I tell you like that, the, the shape of hugging him is exactly at the right shape. Or um, interestingly enough, it was probably a week after he died. My boss's wife was watching my oldest son and he came home with a hat that was given to him by like my boss's son. And it's like one of those goofy stocking caps with like the long tassels, you know, the ones. And mm -hmm. My friend used to compulsively wear these stupid things, I think, just to get a rise out of people. But it was so strange because my son received this hat as a gift out of the blue, like right when it would have been like really consoling and important to me. Um, so I don't know if that even begins to answer your question, but I was just thinking about that when you were talking about that. And so I guess, like, what do I glean from that? Like, can I can I say either way? Is he in heaven? Is he in hell? I don't know. But what I what I glean from that is maybe maybe there's some communication to me that I need to pray for him more. 
And so that is what I now try to do. And that's, that's that. So uh, on the basis of that description, which, uh, yeah, I mean, it's terrible in the sense that, you know, s sorry for your loss. Um, it's consoling in the sense that it seems not without purpose. And it, like, as you were talking, I was thinking about it in terms of reconciliation, uh, which we use to describe a variety of different acts of the human heart. Um, but oftentimes, you know, so Father Jacob Bertrand read that text from St. Thomas Aquinas, where he talks about a certain debt that needs to be fulfilled or a certain obstacle that needs to be addressed. And often enough, you know, like it's our own anger, right? Or it's our own resentment that keeps us from being reconciled to others and to the reality of our state. But I think that there's a kind of like deeper reconciliation that needs to go on ultimately in the life of every human being, which is a kind of reconciliation to the providence of God. Like it just a basic recognition that God is good that he loves us, right? That he trusts us, that he entrusts us with our very lives so as to conduct them unto him. Um, and I guess, you know, like departing from your experience as you yourself are kind of like reconciled to the plan of God and coming to a better understanding of what it is that's at work in the loss of your friend and where you go forward from that. And then in your work as a mortician, just seeing people reconciled, maybe reconciled on the occasion of the death of a loved one or reconciled to God after a long time away. I don't know if you have yeah. some, I don't know, some stories about that or some thoughts about that reflections as to like how we, you know, you know here and now who may be close yeah. to death or not might cultivate a spirit of reconciliation. Yeah. I mean, you do see it and it, it is interesting, you know, the, the gentleman that I, that I mentioned made that kind of like quasi Catholic Lutheran confession, like he lived a fairly dissolute life. But it was really interesting to, you know, I mean, I actually wrote about, I, I wrote about both things, his confession and the, the kind of uh, uh, rascalness, uh, rascality of his life in his obituary. Um, but it is interesting, though, because I did have people come up after me like, wow, that was, you know, even just just the witness of having his funeral and knowing that he went from point A to point B, even if it was right at the end, even that witness, I think people were moved by. And so I, I can't say if, you know, maybe, maybe people reconciled with the church or what, um, but certainly just the witness of seeing that is a really beautiful thing and a good reminder for us. Um, and it helps. I mean, Hey, I, I have the advantage. I'm in the middle of it all the time. So, so I, I, I have the advantage of um, just kind of being there and watching it happen and being able to reflect on this uh, daily, essentially. So it's, yeah, it's a, uh, it's interesting. And, and like, and I do think, and I, I try to, when I have families that fight, let's say, and there are families that I've had that have fought for decades and they have to get together to bury their mother. I do always try to find a way to build a bridge between them. Even if it's just for these four days where we must be together, we have to get along. We have to find a way to love the other, even if it's just for four days. And I don't, I don't have the advantage of seeing what happens to these families after they depart. You know, where are they at three years from the fact? Um, but I, I do tend to see, I do tend to see reconciliation happen over funerals. I, I, I tend to see it. There's, I guess with our, our last couple minutes together, this sort of, um, I was going to ask two questions, but I think I already answered the first sufficiently, at least for my sake of the sort of, well, Catholic, kind of reaction to knowing whether or not ghosts or spirits exist, I think having a sort of, as we've already talked about, a, a healthy sort of appreciation, right? Maybe that's a weird way to put it, but for the spiritual, um, recognizing that the spiritual does exist, we may not have all the answers as to how, why, when, where, all of those things, but that that it does exist and that we are not divorced from the spiritual world. Um, I think that's an important thing as, as, the faithful as believers to to remember and keep in mind and especially as we we're getting close to the month of november which is typically dedicated to praying for our for our dead in in, in more direct and intent ways so as from your um yeah again from your experience from your line of work victor what is do you have any good tips for for doing that without becoming morbid in that sense without without sort of delving into um yeah just like pop culture kind of things about the dead but to to sort of yeah invest well in the reality of this part of the the cosmos that we occupy 
I, I think it's okay to be a little bit morbid, if I'm being honest. Um, knowing that you will die is a very, very good thing. Um, I, I, I said, actually, I was emailing with a family the other day, and they were joking that their dad had very dark humor, and he did. He was, he was an interesting character. Um, but I said, you know, a man who knows he's going to die is a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I, I think being a little morbid is okay. I think the, the one beautiful thing is like the church embraces that. And then they also set aside like one whole day for that. Like All, all Souls Day is, is just so great um, because, yeah, like you can be a little morbid and you can think about your dead. I, I always try to take at least the morning off of All Souls and go to Mass and pray for my friend. Uh, but the, the parish where I go, I mean, it's like candles and the priests are in black. And, you know, like I think there's the, the one, the vestment he wore last year had a skull and crossbones on it. Like, that's OK. I think it's it's OK to to think about think about death and to just kind of embrace that, even if it's just for a day. I, I think it's worth doing. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, as do I. I think it's as we there's a. I don't know if it's a phrase or saying that it's it's good to die as a Dominican or no know, knowing Dominicans because we offer a lot of suffrages in the order uh, and traditionally for our dead brothers benefactors friends of the order um, those sort of things so uh, yeah Dominic uh, was and, and the order following Saint Dominic's inspiration has always been dedicated to that but yeah obviously in particular ways on particular days according to the church's um, calendars, the feast days, all souls, November, the rest. So there's, there's a real beauty in that dimension to our, to our faith too, that shouldn't, that shouldn't be overlooked. So I think you're spot on on that. Well, I think that's the time that we have for today. So Victor, thanks so much for being with us again yeah. on the podcast. It's really excellent to to spend the time with you, to hear, to hear from you, to get your thoughts and, and wisdom on these things. As you said, you're, you're kind of in the midst of, of this world and I guess as priests we are in some ways, but not certainly not to the degree that you are. So thanks for thanks for sharing that and spending the time with us. Yeah, it's honestly it's a little it's, it's a little refreshing not to have to talk only about dead bodies. It's nice to talk about the other half of the equation. So, thank you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, it's a, our pleasure for sure. So thanks too for listening to the to this episode of God's Planning. Uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Like, subscribe, leave a five star review. If you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, follow the link in the description. You can also follow the links in the description to shop God's Planning merchandise to get information on upcoming God's Planning events. Thanks again for tuning in. We're praying for you. Please pray for us. And until next time, God bless. Mm -hmm.